Chapter 5. Mawe Begins to Starve Part of the answer arrived in late September. Not long after taking our final exams, Gilbert and I went to the trading center to play a few games of Bawo. As we walked back to his house, I noticed something odd. About a dozen people were gathered in his yard talking in low, worried voices. They were mostly women, each wearing brightly colored headscarves like my own mother and carrying an empty basket. Who are these people, I asked. They've run out of food in the far villages, Gilbert said. These women have come to ask my father for handouts, or ganyu. Some of them walked for days. Ganyu was another word for day labor, or a small job such as clearing fields or digging ridges for a little money or food. It's how many farmers in Maui made a living when times were hard, but I'd never seen this many people at once. What's your father going to do, I said. He's going to feed them, Gilbert answered. He has no choice. He's their chief. What Gilbert said was true. The drought had destroyed all of the crops in the countryside, and the families in the smaller villages had run out of food. Their storage rooms were empty, and now they were hungry. I came home and told my father what I'd just witnessed. He'd also seen the lines of women, but didn't seem too concerned. He explained that the government always kept giant stocks of maize for emergencies. In tough times like these, they sold it on the market for a reduced price so that everyone could afford to eat. A few days, don't worry, he said. Whatever the case may be, our family has never gone hungry. A few days later, however, my father returned from the trading center where a group of farmers had held a rally. They delivered some terrible news. A few dishonest men in the government had sold our emergency maize and taken off with the money. They're saying there's nothing left, he told my mother. This year will be a disaster. My mother's face seemed stricken. Only God can help us, she whispered. After that, Hunger came to Malwai. Due to the shortage of maize, the price doubled in the market. When this happened, people started hunting for food in the forest. One evening before dinner, I was feeling a bit hungry, so I walked next door to see if I could snatch a few mangoes from Mr. Mawali's trees. When I arrived, he and his family were sitting down to steaming plates of food. Just in time, I said. But when I looked closer, I realized what the Mawalis were eating. Pumpkin leaves and stewed green mangoes. They weren't even ripe and I'm sure they tasted awful. You'll find no food here, Mr. Mwale said, wrinkling his nose as he chewed. Later, I saw several men digging ridges in Mwale's field for Ganyu. They were from the outer villages, and each walked away carrying a handful of those same green mangoes. A few days later, while walking through the trading center, I saw something else I'd never seen. Women had spread out plastic tarps and were selling gaga. Gaga are the clear, colored outer layers or shafts that are removed from the maize kernels in the mill. It's mostly garbage, left on the mill floor and tossed away. Farmers fed it to their chickens and pigs. I like to use gaga in my bird traps, but I'd never seen people eat it. Yet here, it was selling in the market for 300 kawacha a pail, three times what it normally cost. A group of women held metal buckets and crowded around the sellers, pushing one another to get some. Move away! I was here first! We're all hungry, sister. There are no firsts in that. When I returned an hour later, all the gaga was gone. Right then, I felt a shock pass through me, as if someone had shaken me awake in the night. I started running home. Until then, I hadn't worried much about our own situation. Being 13 years old and always hungry explained some of that. Each meal, I'd stick up my plate and ask for seconds, saying, That's right, keep it coming. Sure, I knew about the problems throughout the country, but for some reason, I always assumed they were happening to someone else. Now as I headed home, I grew more and more afraid. When I reached the house and opened the door to the storage room, I nearly fainted. Only two bags of grain remained. In my mind, they were already gone. I started doing the hunger math. Two bags of maize wouldn't last two months. In three months, we'd be starving. Worse, there were still 210 days, about seven months until our next harvest. We hadn't even planted one seed, and once we did plant, there was no guarantee that it would rain or that we'd even have fertilizer. A few days later, my father started rounding up our goats to sell in the market. And Malwai, your animals are your most prized possessions, a farmer's only token of wealth and class. Now we were trading them for a few pails of maize. The men who ran the Cayenne stands selling fried meat had enormous power now. The prices they offered for goats, pigs, and cows went lower each day, yet people still lined up to sell. I noticed one of the goats was Mankahalala, one of my favorites. Unlike the other goats, he loved to play. He let me grab his horns and wrestle in the courtyard. He and Kamba had also become friends and would chase each other around the kitchen, irritating my mother.
Papa, why are you selling our goats, I asked. He turned to me. A week ago, the price was 500 Now it's 400 I'm sorry, William, but if we wait any longer, we'll get nothing. The goats were tied by the legs with rope and already crying. Kamba heard the commotion and came to investigate. When he saw Mankahalala being led down the trail with the others, he started to bark and jump. Mankahalala then turned around as if to plead for help. He knew his fate, but as much as it hurt me inside, I had to watch him go. What could I do? My family had to eat. In early November, I started waking up as usual at 4 a.m. to make my ridges. On the first morning, when I walked inside to have my breakfast, my father met me in the darkness. No fala today, he said. Huh? It's time to start cutting back. We need to save our food. By this time, our supply of maize was just one and a half bags. Breakfast was first to go, and I wondered what would be next. But instead of complaining, I drank a big cup of water, grabbed my hoe, and went to meet Jeffrey in the fields. I told him about skipping breakfast. Can you believe it? I asked. But my cousin simply shrugged. You're just starting that today, he said. I haven't had breakfast in two weeks. I'm getting used to it. In the early morning, the weather was still cool and I could dig my ridges with great energy. But by 7 a.m., my stomach had woken up and realized it was empty. It growled and rumbled and demanded to be filled. Soon the sun was high in the sky and sucking all of my strength. The only thing keeping me awake was my father marching past. Make those ridges better, he shouted. But I'm too hungry, Papa. Think about next year's harvest, son. Try your best. It was true. My ridges looked crooked, as if a slithering snake had dug them. Across the field, Jeffrey was hard at work. Mr. Jeffrey, I called out. You dig my ridges today, and I'll dig yours tomorrow. Can we make this deal? I'll think about it, he said, gasping for breath, but it sounds like the same deal as yesterday. I was trying to raise my cousin's spirits. Ever since his father died, he hadn't been the same. He looked sad, and sometimes he stayed in his room for an entire day and didn't speak to anyone. He was also sickly. At a recent trip to the clinic, the doctor said he had anemia, which is caused by not having a healthy diet. I later discovered that breakfast wasn't the only thing Jeffrey was skipping. Food was running low all around. I'm joking, I shouted, but seriously, man, you don't look good. Take a break and get some rest. I have no choice, he said, swinging his hoe. You know my deal. I also knew that Jeffrey wouldn't be returning to school in the next term. Because of the drought and losing her husband, Jeffrey's mother didn't have the money to pay his school fees. And anyway, she needed Jeffrey and his brother Jeremiah to work and provide food. That day, I pretended not to know. Soon your man, Cam Kawamba, will be in secondary school where he belongs, I said, wearing trousers and walking tall. He'll find us there, Jeffrey said. We older boys have plans for Cam Kawamba. You can't touch him. Oh, you wait and see. Jeffrey wasn't the only one changing. Kamba was also slowing down. I'd always known that his best years were behind him back when he lived on the estate, but now his age was starting to show. And ever since the drought, he'd grown thinner. The food I was feeding him at night just wasn't enough, I guess. As he got slower, the mice in the fields outwitted him, and other dogs beat him to the scraps in the garbage piles. Kamba no longer chased chickens around the courtyard, but stayed in the shade and slept. I was beginning to see his ribs. One night, when I tossed up a ball of Nisima for him to eat, he lost sight of it and it landed right on his head. What's the problem, old man, I teased. He leaned over and sucked down the food in one gulp. Some things didn't change. December arrived with dark skies and heavy rain. All across the region, farmers did their best to plant seed for the next harvest, yet many had abandoned their fields in order to search for food. It wasn't long before their land was choked with weeds. My father managed to plant a small plot of maize, but without any fertilizer. He also found enough seed for a half acre of tobacco, which would provide a lifesaver in the months to come. What began as drought and hunger in Malwe soon evolved into full-blown famine. That winter, it would tighten its grip until few people were left standing. Those looking for food began to cluster in the trading center along the roads, Groups of men carrying their hoes went house to house asking for work, their clothes soaked from the rain and covered in mud. At each place they heard the same reply, We have nothing to give. While the men searched for Ganyu, their wives gathered at the chief's house where Gilbert passed out bags of flour at the door. Already hundreds of people had received food and more kept coming. They carried children who cried from empty bellies and some women were so weak that they fainted once they arrived. 
After Gilbert's mother nursed them back to health, they continued down the road in search of their next bite. The famine arrived at our door sooner than I imagined. During the second week of December, my mother milled our last pail of maize, giving us just 12 more meals. As soon as she left, I opened the storage room and peered inside. All that remained were empty bags piled in a corner like dirty laundry. I tried to remember what the room had looked like when it was full, but I just didn't have the energy. That night, my father called the family into the living room. Given our situation, he said, I've decided it's better if we go down to one meal per day. It's the only way we'll make it. My sisters and I argued over which meal it would be. We should have breakfast, said Aisha, who was 12. I like lunch, shouted Doris. No, my father said, it will be supper. It's easier to keep your mind off hunger during the day, but no person should have to sleep with an empty stomach. We'll eat at night. My stomach was used to being fed every time it grumbled. Having no breakfast was one thing, but not eating breakfast or lunch was a lesson a lesson in patience and pain. It was even harder on my younger sisters, who didn't understand why no one would feed them. Did you hear me, Mama? They cried. I'm hungry. Yes, dear, my mother said. I heard you. Just try to hold on. Dinner didn't come soon enough that first night. My father lit a lantern in the living room, and we all gathered around watching the black soot spiral toward the ceiling. As usual, we started with hand washing. My sister Doris walked around to each person and poured the warm water over their hands while they lathered up with soap and rinsed over the basin. When washing was finished, finally my mother fetched two bowls and lifted the lids. Try to make it last, she said, and joined us on the floor. The first bowl contained the sema, but instead of a mountain of steaming cakes, this was one gray blob. It didn't even look edible. In the second bowl, my mother had prepared a small portion of mustard greens. We passed the food around and didn't even bother using plates. The meal was over in minutes. With less than one pail of flour remaining, I knew that only a miracle could save us, or at least a very good idea. The next morning, my father announced his brilliant plan. We're selling all of our food, he said. It didn't make any sense to me. In fact, it seemed like the worst idea I'd ever heard. But then he explained how we'd use the flour to make cakes to sell in the market. The extra money we earned would go toward buying more food. It was a huge gamble. That morning, my mother mixed the last of our flour with some soy powder and sugar and made zagumu cakes, which resembled small biscuits. The delicious smell of them baking over the fire drifted through the sheets of rain and onto the road, stopping the Ganyu men in their tracks. Even the birds became brave and gathered outside the kitchen to sing a woeful tune. The aroma seemed to enter my body like a spirit, slithering into my empty belly and stretching its arms and legs. Normally, when my mother made zagumu cakes, she'd let me scrape the bowl with my fingers. And Malwai, this was such a cherished privilege that kids had given it a name, VP, after Vipasti pot, meaning the bottom of the pot. Mama, VP, we'd ask, our eyes round with anticipation. But this time was different. My mother used every last drop of batter, as if wiping it clean with a sponge. No VP, only empty pot. That night, my father made a stand from a broken table in an iron sheet. My mother opened for business the following morning, selling her cakes for three quache each. The cakes were heavy and lasted longer in the belly than some of the other cheap breads for sale in the market. If a person didn't have enough money to buy flour, the cakes were their only option. That first day, she sold out in less than 20 minutes. During these hard times, everyone learned the lesson of supply and demand. The rules of economics says that whenever the supply of something is great, say that farmers have a good crop like any normal year, the demand will be low, and so will the price. But when it's the opposite, when the supply is low, like it was during the famine, the demand is overwhelming and the prices soar into the heavens. Ever since the country ran out of maize, businessmen have been traveling into neighboring countries like Tanzania and buying it by the truck full. Back in Wimbe Market, they raised the price, partly because gasoline was expensive and sometimes the trucks broke down, but also they charged more because they knew people were starving and would pay anything to stay alive. Luckily, one of the traders, Mr. Mangochi, was my father's friend and agreed to cut us a deal. For the money my mother earned selling cakes, Mangochi sold her another pail of maize. My mother took it to the mill, saving half the flour for more cakes, while the other half went to us. It was just enough to provide our blob of Nasima each night, plus some pumpkin or mustard leaves as relish. 
It didn't erase our hunger, but knowing our one meal was safe made it seem less painful. As long as we can stay in business, we can make it through, my father told us. Our profit is that we stay alive. A couple of weeks later, my mother was coming home from the market when a giant truck passed her on the road. Its load, was cover- its load was covered with tarps, and some of the other traders said it was maize. They're taking it to the government store in Chamama, someone told her. When my mother got home, she called me over and explained the news. You will go to Chamama tomorrow. Leave as early as possible. Chamama was 12 miles away, so of course I grumbled. Are you sure it was maize and not fertilizer? Because I heard that... Are you listening to me, boy? My mother snapped. She did not like her children talking back, especially not now. You go tomorrow. If my mother was right, it was great news. It meant the government had found surplus maize, perhaps from Tanzania, and would sell it for a discount. With prices climbing higher and higher in the market, it was the only way we could get ahead. The next morning, I awoke at 5 a.m. and set off on my bicycle for Chamama. An empty flour sack fluttered from my handlebars as I rattled down the narrow dirt roads, I noticed many others carrying the same. Chamama, I asked them. Eh, they replied, nodding. The government store was located in the central market. When I finally arrived, I saw the lines of people stretched from the door all the way down the road, longer than two soccer fields. One line was for men, while the other was for women and children. Each was getting longer by the minute, so I parked my bike against a fence and took my place among the men. A cool breeze blew from the lake and kept people in good spirits. But once the scorching sun rose in the sky, the hunger revealed itself in everyone. People suddenly appeared exhausted, as if they hadn't slept in days. The skin around their faces was shrunken, and their eyes squinted against the hard light. It had probably been weeks since many had eaten a proper meal, and the government store was their last and only hope of survival. As the sun rose hotter, they grew more and more feeble. The man in front of me could hardly stay awake. His hands were trembling as if he were cold, and his breathing was heavy and loud. When the line started to move, he couldn't keep his balance and fell down. To my horror, no one helped him up, just simply stepped over him. In the next line, babies cried from hunger and children tugged at their mother's dresses. If there's one thing I'll remember most about that day in Shimama, it's the sound of crying babies. After several hours in line, people got restless and angry, angry at the sun and at the people pressed all around whose starvation reeked of soured rags, angry at the government, at the dust, and at the very air that occupied the emptiness of their stomachs. As we inched closer and closer to the door, their impatience took control. People began to push. Someone shoved me so hard in the back that I grabbed hold of the man in front of me to keep from falling down. A few boys from the end of the line then raced toward the front, squirming into the crowd like mice under a door. Hey, stop cutting people! people shouted. We've been here since dawn. But they kept coming. Everyone knew that at some point the grain would run out and no one wanted to be the loser left holding an empty sack. The more people cut in line, the more the others panicked. Suddenly both lines surged toward the front doors at once. The wave of bodies lifted me off the ground and carried me forward. I felt the air being squeezed out of my lungs and saw the sky disappear above me. I was being swallowed by this enormous terrifying mob and I was helpless against it. Hey, stop, I shouted. I can't breathe. But it was no use. As the mob trapped me in its belly, a strange thing happened. Everything went dark. The screams and moaning of children fell away. The shouting vanished. I drifted in slow motion as if underwater. For a second, I thought that maybe I was already dead, and a small part of me even felt relieved. But no, through the cracks in the crowd, I saw the government building, now closer than ever. The crowd had carried me forward like a cyclone. I managed to plant my feet back on the ground and slither between the bodies. It helped being skinny. A minute later, I reached the front of the pack and stood on the porch of the building. Then I slipped through the doors. Inside, the office was cool and quiet, and in front of me was a hill of maize as high as my waist. It was more food than I'd seen in months, and I'd made it just in time. Outside, the mob had exploded into one giant fist fight. Through the door, I watched a woman fall to the ground and vanish in the dust cloud. Two more women carrying babies on their backs jumped out of the ruckus to avoid being crushed, losing their place in line. They brushed off their clothes and walked away with nothing, and I wondered if they'd make it through another month. Hey, a man shouted. Next! He was shouting at me. I said next! I hurried forward and placed my order. I had 400 kwacha in my pocket, enough to buy the 25 kilograms as advertised on the sign outside. But when I told him what I wanted, he informed me there'd been a change. 
I could only purchase 20, but the price remained the same. So, how much do you want, he said, not even looking up from his ledger. 20. He gave me a ticket and pointed down the line where several workers used metal pairs to scoop the maze. They looked muscular and healthy, nothing like the people outside. The man who measured my maze then cheated me. He threw the bucket onto the scale so quickly that I couldn't see the weight, then emptied it into my bag. Next, he screamed. But wait, I said, you didn't even... He wheeled around. If you don't like it, you can leave it here. There are plenty of people behind you. Next! With little choice, I handed him my money, grabbed my sack, and ran for the door. Despite being robbed, I felt a rush of excitement to be holding so much food, though it quickly turned to fear once I stepped back out into the mob. A man ran toward me, shouting, I'll give you 500 for that. Another pushed him aside. No, boy, I'll give you 600. I pretended not to hear. I strapped the maze to my bike as fast as I could and sped away. Once I reached the road, I didn't stop pedaling until I saw my family's house. As I rolled into the courtyard, my mother and sisters greeted me like a hero. I was exhausted, and my clothes were torn and dirty from the crowd. When I tossed the maze onto my father's scale, it confirmed that I'd been shorted. Fifteen kilos, I said. Only half a bag. My father, my mother told me not to worry. You did fine, and because of you, we'll eat for another week. In the days after Chimama, people started selling their possessions to stay alive. One morning, during a heavy rain, I sat on the porch and watched a line of them pass like slow-moving ants. Women carried giant pots on their heads containing the items from their kitchen. Cups, spoons, knives. Everyday utensils of a normal life unhinged. Men lugged chairs and sofas on their backs. One man dragged a heavy dining room table through the mud. They were all headed for the trading center to see how much money or maize they could get. Because what good was a kitchen table when you had no food to eat it on? Kamba lay sprawled out on the ground at my feet. Every few seconds, his tail flipped in slow motion at the flies that gathered on his back. He was getting thinner and more weak, and I knew it was all my fault. My mother's one meal per day didn't include our dog. The only way Kamba ate was if I shared my portion, and most days I was so hungry that I ate it all without thinking. Lately, in the middle of the night, his groans of hunger had roused me from my sleep, and I'd stayed awake, burning with guilt. It was difficult to even face him now. So once the rain let up that morning, I left him on the porch and followed the people to the trading center. He didn't try to follow. The hunger had transformed the town. Most of the shops, like Mr. Bonda's, were now shuttered, and the market women had abandoned their stalls. The merchants now joined the multitude of starving people looking for food and selling their lives away. Nadiri Nadi Manaladana, a man called out. I've got something to sell. How about this radio? It's yours for a giveaway price. One man sold the iron sheets from his roof for a cup of flour. A nice straw roof could fetch half a cup. What good is a roof when you're dead, he asked. A few of the businessmen, like Mr. Mangochi, bought their neighbor's furniture and later gave it back. But the truth was that most people had no money to buy anything. They simply shook their heads and walked away. Inside the maize mill, a crowd of desperate children gathered around the machine. When the rare woman came to grind a pail of maize, they watched the flower cloud rise from the bucket with dancing eyes. As soon as the customer removed the pail from the spout, the children threw themselves onto the floor and wiped it clean. By mid-December, there was hardly any grain to mill anymore, and the building fell to silence. Then Christmas arrived. Normally, it was my favorite holiday. In better times, we put on our nicest clothes on Christmas Eve and watched the nativity play at church. Later that night, my sisters and I would catch swarms of the flying ants that arrived each rainy season and then roast them in a flat pan with salt and eat them with the sema. Whereas grasshoppers have kind of a nutty flavor, roasted ants taste like chewy dried onions, except more delicious. When eaten along with beans and pumpkin leaves, they are truly heavenly. Christmas morning breakfast was a typically fresh sliced bread slathered with blue band margarine and a mug of steaming chombe tea. A blue band sandwich washed down with milky, sugary tea is the greatest combination you can put inside your mouth. Like anyone, Malwayans love meat on Christmas. Early in the afternoon, my father usually kills one of our biggest chickens and gives it to my mother to cook. But Christmas chicken is not served with Nisima. As I mentioned before, it comes with rice. Ask any Malwayan about Christmas dinner, and they'll always mention rice. But on Christmas 2001, we had none of this stuff. First of all, our chickens had died from disease a few weeks earlier because we couldn't afford the medicine. 
All that remained was one lonely hen who had become a kind of morose symbol of everything we'd lost. No one dared touch her. All the churches canceled their Christmas Eve nativity ceremonies because of the hunger, and that night my sisters and I felt so weak anyway that we didn't bother catching ants. When Christmas morning rolled around, there was no sliced bread or blue band, no tea, and I knew there wouldn't be any chicken and rice either. I felt so sad that I sat on the edge of my bed and didn't move. I heard the sounds of the radio coming through my door. The DJ was playing Silent Night, and it only made me angry. How dare they play that song, I thought. I grabbed my hoe and headed straight for the fields, anything to keep my mind off Christmas. Around noon, my mother did manage to serve us a holiday lunch, but it was just the usual blob of Nathema. She'd probably worked very hard to save enough flour for that extra meal, but it was impossible to eat with a happy heart. Afterward, I went to see Jeffrey, which made me feel even worse. I found him sitting on his bed, looking thin and tired. Ever since his mother had run out of food the previous month, Jeffrey had been one of the people on the road searching for Ganyu. He found work making ridges and pulling weeds, but it didn't provide enough food for his whole family, and often they went entire days without eating. Worse, he'd been neglecting his maize crop. Eh, man, I said. I haven't seen you in days. Your field is full of weeds. They're taking over. Too busy with Ganyu, he said. At first I went looking for enough food for the month, then the week. Now it's all about tomorrow and today. I hadn't seen Gilbert in a while, so I walked over to his house. About 50 people were camped out in his yard when I arrived, and the smoke from their fires covered the place in a dismal haze. Gilbert was standing in the doorway. Merry Christmas, eh? I said, being sarcastic. Not here, he answered. Well, surely Chief Wimbe has prepared some delicious chicken and rice. Gilbert shook his head in disappointment. These people have taken almost everything from us. It's only beans and nisma today. My nose caught something terrible on the breeze. It made my lips curl. What is that? I asked. Oh, he said, pointing toward the campers. They're not even bothering with the latrine anymore. Now they're just defecating in our grass. Be careful where you walk. Yeah, for sure. With Jeffrey busy with Ganyu and Gilbert busy with hungry people, I decided to see if my cousin Charity was around. Charity was a few years older. His parents lived in another village while he worked the fields around Wimbe. He lived by himself in a kind of cool clubhouse where teenage boys gathered to discuss soccer, girls, and whatever else. I never really knew, since most of the time they kicked me out. Whenever one of them said, William, I think I hear your mother calling, I knew it was my signal to leave. This time, though, Charity seemed happy to see me. No one wants to be alone on the holidays. He invited me inside where a small fire was burning in a cooking pot. It's Christmas and I'm starving, he said. I haven't eaten a thing. Yeah, I said. I'm hungry, too. The two of us began thinking of ways to get food. The mangoes were all eaten and gone, and the businessmen in the training center wouldn't dare give us any flour. What about James, I said. Our friend James ran a kind of Cayenne stand, but instead of selling fried goat meat, he boiled the brains and hooves, something called head cheese. Trust me, it's more delicious than it sounds. In fact, my mouth watered just thinking about it. Perhaps James will be generous on Christmas and let us have some, I said, feeling confident. Charity waved me off. Don't be stupid. Then his eyes brightened and he said, but he does throw away the skins. Can you eat that? I said, twisting my face. I'm thinking, why not? What's the difference? It's all meat, right? Yeah, I guess you're right. The hunger had screwed up our brains. On the way to see James, we passed the other Cayenne stands. A group of wealthy businessmen stood around eating meat and fried potatoes. They laughed and joked as they devoured the greasy bits, not even stopping to swallow before stuffing their faces again. Nor did they seem to notice the crowd of villagers that gathered round just to watch them eat. To these men, the hunger was invisible. James's stand was just down the road. He was there, as usual, hunching over his boiling pot. As we got closer, I could see a goat head bobbing inside the roiling water along with some leg pieces. My stomach howled and I had to turn away. <coughs> hey, James, Charity said. William and I are making a Christmas drum for the children in the village. We're wondering if you could spare one of your skins. That's a good idea, said James. He turned and nodded toward a black mound in the dirt, swarming with flies. Take that one there. I was going to throw it out anyway. Charity grabbed the hide and stuffed it into a jumbo bag, then handed it to me. It was still warm. Sakomo kwa nibiri, Charity said. Thanks a lot. The kids will appreciate you. Sure, sure. We hurried back to Charity's house, wasting no time. How are we supposed to prepare this, I asked, peering inside the bag. 
Easy, said Charity. We'll just cook it like a pig. Back inside, I added some twigs to the fire and got it going again. Once it was good and hot, Charity and I held the corners of the hide and stretched it over the flames. The hair sizzled and flared and gave off an awful smell. Once it looked charred enough, we took our knives and scraped it away. We did this again and again until it was properly cleaned. We cut the skin into strips and threw them in a pot of boiling water, adding a little salt and baking soda. What's the soda for, I asked. It's how the women make their beans cook faster, he answered. I'm thinking it works with skin, too. After three hours, a thick white foam formed on top of the water. Charity took out his knife and fished through the froth, pulling out a steaming piece. It was gray and slimy. He blew on it to cool it down, then popped it into his mouth. His jaws worked and worked, trying to chew it up. Finally, he swallowed. How was it, I asked. A little tough, but we're out of firewood, so let's eat. I snagged a long piece of skin with my knife and held it in my fingers. It was sticky as if covered with scalding glue. I stepped it into my mouth and breathed in, feeling the rush of heat instantly calm my angry belly. As I chewed, the juices sealed my lips shut. Merry Christmas, I managed to say. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Just then, I heard a clawing at the door and realized it was Kamba. He must have smelled the Christmas meat all the way from home and come running. His bony frame was bent and tired, but his tail was whacking. I was glad to see him. Give some to that dog, Charity called out. It's dog food reading anyway. I bent down and rubbed Kamba's head. Let's get you something to eat, chap. I'm sure you're starving. I tossed Kamba a long piece of skin, and to my surprise, he leaped up and snatched it from the air, just like old times. I went to the pot and pulled out two more giant handfuls. After he'd finished his meal, the life seemed to return to his body. I lost count of how many pieces I ate myself, but after about half an hour of chewing, Charity and I gave up because our jaws were too tired. As the sun went down that afternoon, the three of us sat around the cold fire, content with the warm feeling of meat in our stomachs, because that's what Christmas was all about anyway.